Hi, this is Randy Kay with the Heaven Series. My special guest is Wayne Fowler. Uh, Wayne and I have become, I, I, at least I feel, instant guests. He, he also clinically died and he met Jesus face to face in heaven. But what we're going to start out with is his advent to that uh, afterlife experience when he became a believer in Jesus just prior to his dying. Some of you uh, have watched our interview with Brian Melvin, who was an atheist when he entered into his afterlife experience and he experienced hell. So um, it is wonderful, Wayne, to have you with us uh, today. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to relate the, the message. And that's ultimately the message of Jesus. So it was an awesome experience to me. I look forward to it. Well, thank you again. And we have a number of people who have been waiting for this interview. We had a preview of it uh, that was uh, went out uh, previously. And so let's start with uh, how you became a believer just prior to your heart attack. Yes. And well, Randy, it's, it, it's so amazing. But I think I'm trying to figure out, is it more amazing to me that how it happened? But my life before this was not one. I, I was not a Christian. I had actually, um, I didn't believe in a devil or a hell. Uh, uh, I actually did believe that there was a God. I, I thought to myself, you know, I thought that that was just really, guys, think about it. I'm, I'm looking around and I'm seeing all of this creation and, and beauty and humanity and the diversity of life and that sort of thing. And I just thought there was definitely something that created this that was bigger than us all. I just didn't know who or what that was. But one of the things that I had always said was, you know what, if I ever get the chance to meet this God, I will follow him, her, it, whatever that is. Just, I really wanted to know, but I just didn't know up to that time. My wife, who, uh, Denise, that you'll hear about later on, uh, she actually had been a Christian, a spirit-filled Christian, but uh, she had been away from the Lord for a number of years. Uh, and that's when we met and got together. Well, to, to move forward, after we had been married several years, uh, we, uh, we had a, a son that was eight years old, uh, and then our daughter was three at this particular time, and I thought to myself, there was something that was really prompting me, saying, we really need, Denise, we sat down and talked about this, I think we need, this is the time, um, and to, to let them kind of have a taste for it, because, of course, we didn't go to church or anything like that, but I was thinking to myself, okay, she agreed, what does that look like, what do we do, and I thought to myself, well, you know what, what we could do is we can start, I remember when I was a kid, there was this thing called uh, what was it? Um, uh, vacation Bible school. Yeah, that's what it was called. And I remember I had actually been to one one time and I was really enjoying it. Maybe the kids would be interested in doing something like that. They have some activities. They would be introduced to a Christian God and, and we'll just start there. And she said, yeah, that's, that sounds like a great idea. So, uh, we go through all this thing and trying to be able to find someone who can do that. We ultimately find one church because we've got to have a church that has a bus. That bus has to be able to pick up the kids, the kids, that, you know, and that sort of thing. It comes down after all of our research down to one. And uh, so while I'm at work, she finds out all about this one particular church. So we come back and she tells me, Wayne, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? She says, it is such a small world. The pastor of this church was actually my choir leader back when I was saved. And I said, really? Of course, I didn't know anything about what 
saved or anything like that was. And I said, oh, that's, that sounds very interesting. You're right, it is a small world. Well, unbeknownst to me, at the time, she goes and then invites the pastor to our house because they make a reconnection, they come, and ultimately, I end up speaking to this pastor, and I thought it was very interesting. I had never had an opportunity to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one with a pastor, right? Uh, and so I was... I was just very intrigued. There was some information that I, I didn't know about and discussions about things that, uh, that I'd never considered. And so he had come over several times and I was really enjoying this. I was thinking, I, I found out more in this, in this little bit of time than I have known about at least what the Christians are saying about this than I have in a long time. Well, here it is, fast forward, to 1989, and it's a week before Halloween. And the pastor says, you know, we've got this evangelist coming in. We're going to have a revival at the church. I really think, Wayne, that you're going to like this guy. Would you be interested in coming to see him? And I said, sure. You know, that sounds like a good idea. And so we actually went. And the first day, Randy, I was like, oh, there, there's something really different here. This guy is talking about things. It, it wasn't some hellfire and damnation type of thing. It wasn't some person up there accusing me and pointing a finger. It was somebody that was actually explaining about this Jesus, explaining about the culture, explaining about the time, explaining the meanings of words. And, and I was like, yeah, because I'm, and as you'll find out, I like these details. These details just really mean something to me. And I was like, wow, that was really interesting. And so then the pastor after that comes to me and says, well, what did you think about that, Wayne? I said, I really enjoyed that. He said, what do you think about coming tomorrow? And I said, I think I will. So, all right, let me do a sidebar here because the kids are getting ready for Halloween. And at that point in time, I loved Halloween. I loved all of the, you know, the everything from just the spiders and snakes and everything else, you know, just the ooh and you boo and scare people and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the little kids and trick-or-treating as well as that kind of thing. So uh, we had purchased uh, a couple of costumes for our kids to wear. And uh, it just so happens they were getting ready. We had candy purchased and that sort of thing. Well, the kids, uh, of course, they, had, uh, they would go to daycare while uh, Denise and I went to work. They ended up coming home and they were covered in chicken pox. And, and they were just really having a tough time. And I was playing dad, right? I'm thinking, okay, kids, it's not going to be so bad. You're going to itch and everything else. And don't scratch them. You know, that's going to be that kind of thing. And, but it, it'll be fine. You'll be good. But they, my son asked me, well, what about Halloween? And I went, well, let's, let's, uh, let me think about it and I'll tell you what we can do. Okay. And so he said, all right. And, uh, so I went to the next day and of course the, I really enjoyed it once again. And I feel this draw, there's, there's something beyond, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I don't know, but there's something really wanting to get me there. And I, I want to go again. Well, the day before the last day, so that's Hallow's Eve, October the 30th, I get chicken pox. Now, I, I end up going to the doctor, and this was really bad. I mean, really bad. I was running 104 plus temperature. I was covered in dots. You, you, I, uh, I, I looked like uh, 
a pizza that was covered in all kinds of tiny pepperoni. And it, it, it was horrible. It, it was going, ooh. And uh, well, and, that could be dangerous for an adult. Well, Very not only that, I was confused. I had had chicken pox when I was a kid. Oh. And I didn't think you could have them again. And so I went to the doctor and I'm saying like, this, could it be something else or something? And he said, no, you've got the chicken pox. And yeah, he was saying the same thing. Yeah, I know it's, it's really tough on you. Uh, and I said, but I thought you couldn't get it again. And he said, well, it doesn't happen very often. It is rare, but it can happen. And I'm thinking like, oh, lucky me, right? Mm. And so I go back uh, home and I'm telling my wife, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, so what do we do about tomorrow? And I said, let me think about it, baby. Um, I don't know. I really want to go. Um, but just, just let me think about it. The last thing I do, I don't want anybody to get sick or something like that. I don't want to be silly about it. So I, uh, I slept on it that night and I came up with a plan. This is what we're going to do. And so I've got a plan for the kids. This is what we're going to do. Kids, go ahead and put on your costumes, okay? And that way, no one will see that they're covered in dots, right? And I say, keep the door closed. You just go ahead and you put the candy in this, uh, this pail. And so if anybody comes and knocks on the door, you just hold the pail outside the door and let them grab some candy out of it, right? And he said, then that way you don't have to worry about being in face-to-face -face contact with anybody. You don't have to worry about anybody getting sick, that sort of thing. They weren't running a temperature at that particular time, but still I'm trying to be able to be safe, right? And my son says, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So that's what they did. But then my wife, Denise, asked me, Wayne, what are you going to do? And I stopped there for a minute and she said, can I tell you something? I said, okay. <clears throat> and she said, I know you don't believe in the devil, but I really believe Wayne that he's trying to keep you from going. And if you will just give me the benefit of the doubt and you go, then I think that something's going to happen. And I said, okay, all right. What if, what if what she was saying is true? So I said, all right, this is what we're going to do. I was still in a bad state now. I was still running a temperature and, oh, it was horrible. Covered in these dots. I, I, oh, oh, my goodness. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's one of those things where you just, you know, you walk by people and they go, you know, like mm. they kind of shy away from you. It's like, uh I, don't yeah, like I was thinking, I was thinking the same thing, Wayne, as uh, <laughs> as your wife at the time. That uh, you know, this sounds like an attack that's so rare to get chickenpox again. And you know what? What? So what happens? You uh, when you you went to church then? And yeah. So this and, is my plan. I'm I'm going. I said, let's go ahead and wait until everyone actually goes into the chapel. Right? Goes into the meeting. And we'll wait out in the car. I put on this hoodie. Now, of course, it was okay because it's starting to get a chill in the air and everything else. So it doesn't seem abnormal. And I can cover my face up and everything else and no one can see me, right? And I said, when everyone gets in and the worship starts, right? And we can hear that. Then you go in, honey, and find us a pew somewhere way in the back away from everybody. And then I'll come in a couple of minutes later and I will look for you and you can kind of, you know, usher me in and uh, I'll go ahead and, and go in and we'll, we'll try it that way. That way I'll be away from everyone, but I'll still be able to go. And she said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So that's what we did. So we, we get all 
together. We drive to the church and I park and we wait for everyone to, uh, to go ahead and go in. Well, I'm waiting and we're waiting. And then ultimately we hear the first worship song starting. And I said, okay, baby, go ahead and, and go in and find us a place. And she says, all right, uh, I'll be in and, and just look for me in a couple minutes. All right, I will. So she goes in and I'm waiting and I'm waiting a couple of minutes and making sure that no one's around. And I walk in and of course the, the little vestibule is empty and and you know the doors, uh, church doors into the service area, they have these long kind of rectangular windows. They're very thin. And so I put my eye up to this little window and I'm kind of, you know, looking around, seeing if I can find Denise. And so then I look, oh, oh, I see her over there, right? She's got this arm, she's going, come on, like this. Well, she's sitting in this tiny, little pew. I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh, and apparently it's a pew for ushers and that's where they sit them so that they can see everybody. It's a, it's a rather large place that holds about 1,500 people. So it was large and so that was for the ushers. And I thought, that's perfect. It was just big enough for two people. And I thought, awesome. That was picked out just for us. So I walk in there, and of course it's dark because they've got the lights off, and except on the uh, on the stage there. And so I go in and I sit beside her, and she's really excited, you know, that we're able to get in there. And so I start trying to get into the worship songs, and uh, you know I'm going like, okay, everything looks good, and I can feel this something in the air. There's just something tangibly different. And I'm, I'm, I'm not quite able to put my finger on it, but it's real. And then this song comes on. And I love this song. Our God is an awesome God. And it, the whole crowd starts to sing that. And I can just and I'm getting chills as I'm thinking about it because I did then too. And I could feel this and I start singing this. And I had heard that before and they've got the words up on the screen up there, and I'm belting out these words and right in the middle of redoing this chorus, I notice Denise, if somebody is looking at me. And, and so I you know, it, just like you feel someone staring at you. And I just kind of look over and this is Denise and she's got, her mouth is a gate. She's, and I'm going, honey, what's wrong? <laughs> and she says, you've got to go to the bathroom. And I'm, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> she said, yes, you do. You've got to go to the bathroom right now. I don't, okay. But I, I was trying to figure out what was somebody seeing me? Was I not properly covered up? I didn't know. And so I quickly, I get out and I go out into the vestibule and it's running through my, what on earth is the problem? And I go across and I go into the men's room and, uh, I'm looking at myself, okay, I'm well covered up, there's, there's nothing that I can see, and I go in front of the, the sink, and I put my hands on the sink, and I'm looking at the mirror, and I'm talking to myself, what on earth is she wanting me to come in here for, uh, is that to try to get me around, it? and I'm just going, I just don't, what, and, I, and I'm thinking, like, are my eyes playing tricks on me? And then I reach up, Randy, and I pull down this hoodie. All the pox are gone. They're all gone. And I, I put my face real close to the mirror. And I'm like, what? What? And I'm looking at my arms. I pull up the thing on my arms. There's nothing there. And I undo the front of my shirt. And I'm like, I, they're, wow. they're gone. They're all gone. And wow. I 
that I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And suddenly I'm just filled with, okay. And I take off that hoodie and I just take it off and I come with my chest out and everything else. And I go back into the, uh, into the service. Denise is watching for me and she's beaming. And I said, I've been healed. And she went, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, oh my, oh my. So we then go through this whole service. I won't uh, try to do anything like that, but this service, I'm getting, there's this greater and greater and greater feeling. There's this greater presence that I am not used to. I haven't experienced it before. And I, I'm, I'm wanting more of this. And so at the end of the services, they always give an altar call. Well, that was one of the things. So uh, this is a Pentecostal church. And so one of the things that, that they're doing is they, they believe in speaking of tongues. I didn't know anything about that. But one of the things that I had thought up to this time was, uh, as they're trying to get me to speak in tongues, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to make myself do it, guys. We're talking about God here, right? And I'm not going to put on in front of God, if that's the case. If God wants me to speak in tongues, he's going to do it, or it's not going to happen. And that's the way I felt about it. And so I wasn't going to do anything, but I'm thinking something, something's going to happen here. And so they give an altar call. Randy, I am not kidding you. I'm all the way as far back in this church as you can get. I was the first one there. <laughs> they are just mere feet from the first pew. I was first in line. I, I was breakneck speed as fast as I could go. And, uh, and so I'm there expecting uh, a couple of minutes later, of course, Denise catches up with me and she's beside me and she's got the smile on her face and everything else. Well, we go through this whole thing, the sinner's prayer and that sort of thing. I was happy to say it again. And I'm happy to just give my heart to Jesus. Yes, I'm doing it because I know I'm supposed to be here for a reason. This is true. There's something about this. I'm doing it. And so then I'm praying. So they're saying that, okay, pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm going like, okay, fine. I'm doing it. I'm praying. I'm praying. And I'm praying. Nothing happens. And I open my eyes and I'm thinking like, why not? After all this has been going on, why, why not? And I look over at my wife, Denise, and something is obviously happening to her. And I said to myself, well, if it's not for me, if it's not going to happen to me, at least I can pray for her. Randy, that's when it happened. I put my hands on her and I prayed for her to be touched by God. I prayed for her for this filling of the spirit. And in that moment, it was like I was being electrocuted with love. And it started in my mm. hands and it started to fill my whole body. I didn't, I didn't know what to think. I, it was just this strength. And once I felt this, once it was all over me, all in me and through me, then suddenly I throw my hands up and I am starting to speak in this language I have never had come out of me before. Mm. It was, it was, I, I had no control over it. It was not I, to me, I was praising God. I'm thinking like, what is going on here? 
but uh, I'm speaking in this heavenly language. Okay, fine. But here then is what's happening to me. I am like pulled into this realm. I start feeling these waves, like this ocean, these waves of love that I hadn't experienced before start to whoosh. They feel like just waves just rolling over me. And I then hear the voice of God. I hear the voice of God. And was he, this an audible voice? Wayne, it was or? an audible voice. Audible to me. voice. But I can also tell you at the same time that I hear this, all of the, the surroundings, everything, uh, the people, everything else, I, I'm completely oblivious to it all. I'm suddenly in this space and it's all pink and and light uh like this mist this white pink mist and i'm surrounded by it and i'm thinking it's like this ocean that's been for lack of a better term and it's this wave of love which is whoosh, whoosh. Mm. and then i hear the voice of god and he says wayne today i have begotten you Today I have begotten you. Begotten you. I didn't know what that meant wow. exactly. Uh, I, I meant that I'm thinking like, wow, I knew that was good. And uh, and I and I'm thinking like, okay, so this was a moment for something, right? And uh, and so what, of course, what I find out later, it's not during this time because I, I have no clue what he's saying, right? I, I'm not understanding what that means. He was meaning I was born at that time. I was reborn. I was born again. He rebirthed me. I was begotten at that time by him. And so that's what that meant. Well, I'm lost in this presence with him and everything else and so what happens then is i'm thinking it's like a few minutes have gone by right but then i feel this rumbling uh in i'm thinking like oh what was that and then i feel myself kind of pull back a little bit and then I feel it again, boom, 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 boom. And then I can recognize, wait a minute, it feels like a, a rumbling in my chest. And then I feel like I'm pulled back into, I hadn't realized I had, I had been out to, in, in some other space. And, and, and my eyes, I, I try to open them and the light is hurting my eyes. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm squinting, and then I'm realizing my, my face is covered in tears, and I'm trying to look around, and then I notice the pastor, he has his arm around me, and he's patting my chest, and I, I look, and then he's right beside me, and then right behind him is his wife, and then I look over on my other side, and there's Denise, and both the pastor's wife and Denise, they're both in tears. They're bawling like a baby, um, and I'm trying to figure out, and I'm looking out. There's no one else there, um, and my first words are, where is everybody, and he said, son, they've been gone for four hours. Oh, my. And I, so you were on the floor for four hours. You were healed of chicken pox and you're just out cold fellowshipping the Holy Spirit. God. Yeah. And so, and, I, and, and he looks at me and smiles and he said, do you realize you were baptized tonight? And I went, I'm thinking back. And then I have this, like this 
vague memory, like it was like way off in the distance, right? And I was like, yeah, I, that was me? He said, yes, Wayne. He said, there were 12 people that came and just touched you and they were filled with the spirit too. He said, it was such a move of God. We had 32 people baptized tonight. And you don't and even remember touching them. No, no. I, I, wow. was, I was completely in the spirit. Wow. And, um, and, and so, and I look back and, and uh, the pastor's wife, she said, she, and she's just got her hands on her face and just tears. And she said, Wayne, Wayne, that was amazing that you have had such an amazing experience. And I said, yes, but then still, even though I'm back, I still feel there would be a wave and my hands would go up and I would be in praise again. I couldn't stop it. I, I would just go in and then I'm trying to refocus and listen to what was being said. And and I'll tell you, too, I couldn't drive home. Denise had to drive home. But what the, <laughs> what, uh, what the uh, pastor's wife had said, she said, that was just so amazing. But Wayne, you have to be careful now. And I said, OK. And not quite sure what she was getting at. She said, the devil's going to want to steal what you just had. Be mm -hmm. very careful and don't let him. And I just went, all right. I, I, I didn't know how to, to respond to that. But I'll tell you this, Randy. I found out seven days later when the devil tried to take my life. He actually took my life. But I ended up meeting Jesus. And he's the author of life, and he gave it back to me. So that right. was almost a prophetic, well, it was a prophetic uh, utterance by the yeah. pastor's wife that the devil would try to steal what you had experienced in your rebirth, being born again in, in Christ. Yes, yes. Now, I'll tell you that, like, for the rest of the week, I was on cloud nine, I, I, I felt like this completely different person. Like there was, like Wayne had just been covered in scrubbing bubbles and all of this stuff that he had been carrying around for his entire life had been washed away. Mm. I, different, I, I, and good, I felt good. And with each of those days, I, uh, I I just wanted to be able to just bask in this, to, to find out, you know, just to, th this was great. I knew because God told me himself, I have been born again. And I knew that was true. And I was not the same. But let me go in to what happened a week later. That seventh day, which I also think is very prophetic as well. Yes. Seventh day. But I woke up and I felt kind of fluish, like some kind of virus was coming on. And which uh, was so different because I'm, I'm a very healthy guy. Uh, I, I was... Uh, Living you were 27 at the time? 26, just right at the cusp of 27. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, uh, so I had, uh, this was just a few days before my 27th birthday. So, yeah, for all intents and purposes, I was 27. But uh, I was in what I considered very good shape. I took care of myself and, uh, and, uh, so, but this day, I just felt like something was coming on and, and it started getting bad very fast. 
And I started feeling very fluish. I didn't quite know how to say it. I started having difficulty breathing. And I felt like I was trying to walk through molasses. I just, it seemed like such an effort for me to move. And, and I'm just, I'm just going along with this as we go through the day. And then I start breaking out into this cold sweat. Mm. And then I'm, I'm starting to feel this, this pain starts to radiate down my left arm from my shoulder and uh, down into my wrist. And I'm thinking to myself, now, I'm 27 years old, and, and, and some people have commented about, like, didn't you think that that might, didn't it cross your mind that you could be, uh, that those are symptoms of a heart attack? Well, no. Like, I mean, I'm a young, virile, in-shape guy. That was the yeah. absolute last thing I would have thought. And, uh, and, and so I'm thinking, uh, I actually had the thought at the time that, okay, uh, what was it caused from? I'm thinking to myself, okay, could, could I have pushed myself too much lifting weights? Maybe that was a pulled muscle or something. Maybe that's what it was. And, uh, and so that early evening, it was about seven o'clock at, at night. And of course, my wife is watching me. And I'm just saying, I'm, maybe I, I'm just really not feeling well. And uh, I think I'm going to turn in early. And she said, okay, honey. And uh, she said, I'll come in there in, in just a few minutes. And I said, well, you don't have to. And she said, no, no, I, I want to. I'll be in there in just a few minutes. And I said, okay. So I went ahead and went in the bedroom and I get ready for bed. I get undressed and, and I crawl in the bed. But I am feeling really bad. And I'm still just trying to think, what could be the problem? I'm not thinking about what uh, pastor's wife had said before or anything like that. I, I'm just confused and thinking, thinking okay, because somebody can get a virus, not a big deal. Um, a few minutes later, Denise comes in and what she does is she gets ready for bed and she lies down beside me. And she had ended up, because, I think probably because I was restless and I'm not able to find a comfortable position. Well, she turns over onto her right-hand side so that her back is towards me. And it is no time at all, Randy. She is sound asleep. And I always say this because it was, I was always so envious of her. I, I've never been able to do that. <laughs> I sleep like a Vietnam vet. I mean, you know, the slightest sound or whatever, <laughs> my eyes pop open, but she could sleep through a tornado, I think. And, and she could go right to sleep. And she did this. So she was sound asleep. And, uh, but I am not doing well at all. I, I, I tried to be able to turn on my left side. Just, no, I can't do that because the pain going down my arm it's really starting to actually throb now. I can actually feel it pulsing. It's like with my heartbeat. Mm. And, you know, and, and I'm just thinking like, okay, that's, that's not good. So I, I try to roll over on my left side and I just can't get enough air into my lungs. And so I, I'm thinking like, so I roll over onto my back. I'm thinking to myself, I've got to... I've got to find a place where I can get some air into my lungs and, and see if there's some way I can relax enough to be able to get some rest. And I'm sitting here thinking about this. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, like an elephant, just like, boom, stomped right in the middle of my chest. It was this powerful, strong, seizing motion. 
And I just instantly grabbed my chest and I just was able to come up just a few inches off of the bed. I couldn't move any further. I was like stuck in this position. And I tried to call out to Denise, but I couldn't. This pain was so intense. The words were like stuck in my throat. I couldn't get it out. It was just so strong. And I, I couldn't move either. The, this pain was like, had me locked into position. And so the first thing I, I'm thinking like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I call out to God. It's in my mind because I can't say anything. And I'm going, God, God, take this pain away, please. If, if you don't take this pain away, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't handle it. And then about a couple of seconds later, suddenly, all the pain in a way mm -hmm. and I, I thought wow that's that's better god heard me i was just amazed that that's what happened god heard me and i start taking stock you know i'm just uh, trying to take stock of myself now my eyes were clenched shut from the pain and so i with this release of pain, I'm just trying to figure out, oh, okay, all this pain is gone. I'm noticing that I'm not experiencing any of the other symptoms either. There's, there's no pain running down my, my arm. I'm, I'm not having any difficulty breathing. Actually, it seems quite simple. And I'm thinking, I don't feel bad at all. In fact, I feel kind of good. And then I thought to open my eyes. And Randy, when I opened my eyes, I realized I wasn't in bed anymore. I was standing beside my bed and I was looking down at my body on the bed. So that release of the pain, the elephant on the chest, that was the point of when your heart stopped. Yes. And now you were a third party to your body. I was, and I was, I was looking down at my body and I recognized I, it was me. I knew it was me. And I knew, and I said to myself, I'm dead. And, and then I just kind of made a little quip to myself and I don't look so good either. <laughs> so I, cause I'm looking at this, this body <laughs> on the bed and there's a hand that's grasped to the chest and, and there's this face that was contorted and it looks like it's in pain, right? This, and, and I'm just thinking, and it's stuck that way. And and I'm just like taking it all in. But I'm also taking in all this other stuff too, because the room and everything, I can see Denise that she's there. It's different because where the room was completely dark, right? When we were in there, suddenly I can see all everything. I can see with this level of clarity that I had never done before. Um, uh, one of the things I talk about is that, uh, you know, I, I wear glasses, as you can see, and I wore glasses then, uh, but this is different. I had what I call superhero vision. I was able to see just like things I, I could never see before. I could focus on things. I could see in the dark. I could identify things. I'm just looking all around. I can take in all of these fine details. I could focus on something and like zoom into it. 
and, and, and just really get this detailed information from it. And, uh, and so right at that moment, I hear this voice from behind me, Wayne, somebody calling me? And then I hear it again, Wayne. And I recognize, of course, that the, the voice is coming from behind me. And so I turn around to look. Now, when I'm looking, so there's, there's things that I'm talking about how this site worked. Well, there be, beside the bed, uh, uh, just uh, a few feet away, there is our wall, uh, that's the external wall. And uh, right up at, at, in this wall, there is this big plate glass window. And, uh, and I can see through the window, I'm looking out and then out, there's a, a, a street that you can see through, uh, that's at the back there of our house. And there's a curb and sitting on this curb is this woman. And I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, I know this person. I don't know how I knew the person, uh, but there was just some recognition inside of me. And, and I thought, what's her name? And uh, her name is Linda. Yeah, Linda. I, I didn't stop to think, who's Linda? I got... I, I didn't, as far as my life went, uh, I didn't have some person, Linda, that I had any connection with or that I could recall, uh, but I knew that this was Linda. And so I'm looking out this window and I can see her, but I can also see with these X-ray eyes that I have, I can see through the wall too. And the thing about it was, it seemed perfectly normal for that to happen. I didn't like question it. I didn't like say, wow, hey, I can see through everything. I've got this x-ray vision. No, there was nothing like that. It seemed perfectly natural that I could do it. So then what happens next is something else that seems perfectly natural, although strange. I walked right through the wall to go out to Linda to see her out there on curb. Didn't seem unnatural at all. It seemed perfectly normal for the thing to do. And so I walk out to her. Now she's sitting on the curb and, but she's in this cone of light that goes completely around her. She's like sit sitting in the center of it as if a spotlight is shining down on her and she's in the middle of it. Well, I, you don't see any anything else and it's just very close to her, just like about a foot away from her, just around her completely. And I walked up to her and I said, hi, you know, with that recognition and she says, Wayne, there's someone that wants to meet you. I said, really? So Linda is saying to you this, and yes. Linda is, she's, she's living at the time. No. No. She's, okay. Yeah, she's, she's a woman that, and I recognize her. She's in the spirit. Uh, I, I, it's not a, a, a woman that's in the physical. She's, this is a, a woman that's in the spiritual. I, I don't know. So she had passed. I'm, I'm guessing. I, but like I said, to this day, I really don't remember who she is. But there was this recognition that I knew her at that moment. And uh, so she then tells me, like I said, that there's someone that wants to meet you. And I said, really, who? And she just looks up like this. And what is 
what is so funny is it's just like, you know, whenever you see somebody do that, what's the first thing you do? You look up too. What are they looking at? <laughs> so I sure. look up like this. And what I see, what looks like so far away is this pinpoint of light, like a star. And, but the rest of the sky that I see is black. There's nothing else there that I can see in the night sky. Just that one star that, that's so far away. And when I recognize uh, or I'm looking at and I see the star, then suddenly what feels like these big, enormous hands grab me right around my center and starts to lift me up. Mm. Now, it, it was these hands, I, I wasn't able to see any hands. Uh, but I could feel them and they were huge. They took out my whole center section, right? And they were warm and comforting. And, and what it felt to me like was, you know, when you have your little child and you reach down and you pick them up and you hold them up and you're playing with them, that sort of thing. That's what I felt like. That was the feeling that I had, this mm. warm, comforting feeling. It felt good, but it shocked me at the same time. So here I'm, I'm being lifted up. And the first thing I do is I throw my hands out to try to steady myself, right? Because this caught me completely off guard. Well, there's absolutely nothing to hold on to, of course. And so I... I thought it was kind of silly, but when I recognized that, I, I caught sight of my left hand. And so then I, I turned my attention to that and I'm looking at it and I can see, whoa, there's this glow. There's this purplish bluish glow that's surrounding all my hand and my arm. And my first thought is, cool. And so <laughs> there. So you're, yeah. you're noticing your arm at this point. What is it translucent, would you say? Or what is it? It, it is. Uh, and, and so like I said, so here's one of the points I also want to be able to make. I wasn't making some deep philosophical recognition of things. So the answer to cool was exactly what I would normally do. So when you die, you're the same person after you, you know, a few minutes later than you were a few minutes before. You're the same personality. There's nothing different there. So I replied the same way that I would have. I thought, yeah, that is really cool. But then this vision, I'm able to see, I'm thinking like my hand, I can see, almost see completely through it. It's translucent. It's not opaque like our hands are physically. And I can see clearly all the veins and everything. So I still have them. I still have the same, same shape. It's still me. It's just a light version of me. Wayne White. And so, <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm looking at all the veins in my hand and there's, there's no blood in them. There's just light is traveling through them. And, and I can see all of that. And I'm thinking like, that is so cool. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, and I, I notice uh, that as I just turn my attention back down and I, I'm noticing Linda, of course, as she's going away from me, which, you know, she's not going away from me. I'm actually going up. And, uh, and so I, I noticed the other things that uh, I'm wearing some clothes. And I now notice as because I'm looking down and I noticed that there are shoes on my feet. And I thought this was off. 
because I had just been in bed and I didn't have any shoes or clothes on. What type of shoes were they? They, they're, they were covering my toes. They seemed like I wasn't quite sure that they, they were actually shoes that I don't have any, any shoes like that. They, hmm. they were, uh, I just thought it was odd. They, they, they were, they appeared to be like leather shoes, um, almost like slippers. Um, but I, I, I didn't have any shoes like that. So I didn't know. I just thought it was <laughs> odd that I had any at all. Um, so, but as I make that recognition and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I start to turn my attention back up and, and the direction that I'm going. Well, I'm then starting to see this direction and I then notice as I go up through the cloud layers and I, and I can see down, I can see just the landmass of uh, North America and I'm starting to, to go up and, and, and then into outer space. And, uh, and, and then of course, as uh, everything starts to get dark from the darkness of space. Well, let me interject this here to um, Randy. It sounds like, you know, I've got this event happening, then this event happening, and these linear successions of events, and that they all add up, and it's like this slow moving thing that I'm doing. But it's not that at all. All of this information that I'm getting is coming at incredible speed, incredible speed so fast that I would liken it as almost happening simultaneously. It's so, so quick, but there is such a level of detail that I can focus on one thing and I can get all that information, make all these observations about it, and I can focus on another one and make all those observations about it almost at the same time. And so, uh, all this thing is again, I mean, it's that fast. So when I'm relating it, I just want you to keep that in mind. So I'm looking up and I'm in outer space. And then what opens up, there's this opening that comes out into space. And it's like the bell of a trumpet. It's the shape of a funnel. And it opens out like this and I can see up in it. Well, it's dark just like space is dark, but I'm able with this vision, I can see it. I can see it quite clearly. It's not a problem at all. And then I go up into the funnel, into this tunnel. Now this, and the first thing that I experience is this cool, gentle breeze. I can just feel it just, and, and, and it's like when, so let's say you were on vacation in Hawaii, you're on the beach and, and you feel this nice cool breeze just come over you. It was like that, it was, it was very comforting and nice. But the biggest thing that caught my attention out of being in there, and at the same time, while I'm actually increasing in speed, is that all around the, the outside of this, or I should say the inside of this tunnel, all up against the walls, are angels. And, uh, and I knew they were angels. I didn't have any question. I knew they were angels. And, and uh, Wayne, I've got to ask you, as I, I know it's one of the most common questions that I get asked, what did the angels look like? Did they have wings? They did. And, and so I, I, I have heard that uh, people uh, talking about, well, you know, angels don't have wings. I'm, I'm here to tell you, all of these angels, they had wings. Uh, <laughs> no question. I concur. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, uh, 
and they were all they they all seemed to me the impression that I got they were military men. Uh, they they were all dressed like in military like uniform. I, I don't know the way to be able to say it. They're all very large, very large, masculine uh, creatures. And and yes, they had their wings. Now their wings were uh, closed, and you could you can see them. They're actually packed like shoulder to shoulder in this thing, all completely around. And I can hear them. They're they're like, you know, uh, speaking to themselves. There there there's this excitement that I'm getting from them, and and this excitement was for me. Hmm. They, they, they were like a welcoming committee. And, and uh, this is the one thing that I talk about, how this is, when I talk about this welcoming committee, they were like a, a procession because they're lined all along this tunnel and I'm going through uh, the middle of them. Well, the thought and feelings that I had were like, it's uh, like it is in a military wedding. So in a military wedding, if you're familiar with this, they have a thing that's called a saber arch. And after the, uh, the, uh, the couple gets married, then you have all of the officers or not the, the military uh, people that they line both sides and they cross their swords up over and above them. And the couple, walks through the center. And it's such a, a, just a wonderful experience for the couple, this honor, this respect, this, and, and this wonderful experience that they get to have. And it's only once in a lifetime, right? Because they're going to be going through there. And that's the way I felt. I was, I was being welcomed just like that. Were there uh, were were there anything that looked like swords? That they no, carried? not that I, I could see. At, at, at that they were all almost like at attention. Uh, mm. That it, it was it was like that. So uh, they were, uh, but they were. <laughs> how do you say it? Not giddy, but but very excited. It was like guys oh, isn't it good to be here type of thing. It was like that. And so they were excited that they were also able to be a part of this. And, and, uh, and so I, I, was just, I was just in awe of that. I was like, they're, they're excited for me. They're welcoming me. Well, uh, and so, but I turn my attention then back towards that pinpoint of light, which is now it's beginning to grow, right? Because I'm getting closer and closer to it. It's beginning to fill up my field of vision. So I recognize it's no longer a pinpoint of light. It is, it's a star. That's gotta be a star, right? Hmm. And, and so that's what I'm thinking, it's a star. Uh, and I, I mentioned that I was starting to speed up and I'm speeding up and speeding up so fast, Randy, I, I recognize that I'm actually going faster than the speed of light.